Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to MST.TV. This is Nishi here bringing you all yet another Market Watch episode. It's been a really busy week for us recently with the full Battles of Legend Armageddon set spoiled, the announcement of a ton of new cards and archetypes from over in the OCG, and a supposed leak of cards being reprinted in maximum gold later this year. The result is a shift in tons of card prices all over the map, both expensive high-end cards as well as some penny stocks that you may not be aware of, Honestly, I could have made this video like an hour long and still had more to talk about, but for now, we will cover some of the highlights from this week. If you guys want to see another Market Watch later on this week, where we discuss some of the smaller, less talked about price shifts and some areas and cards that I think you should be looking into, make sure that you hit that thumbs up button on this video and let me know in the comment section down below. Let's get started. Okay, so kicking things off, let's talk about Fire Formation Tanky. So one of the big decks that got announced in the OCG just this past weekend is the Tri-Brigade archetype coming up in Phantom Rage, a Beast, Beast Warrior, and Winged Beast archetype that basically lets you Link Summon by banishing materials from your graveyard, which is really, really insane. It just so happens that the archetype contains a level 4 Beast Warrior, making that card searchable via Fire Formation Tanky. Now, as a result, we did see a buyout of the Ultimate Rare version of Tanky, which was at around $70 to $80 before, but is now $200 a piece on TCG Player at the moment. We see this happen all the time with Tanky, right? When some new good Beast Warrior support is announced, it's always one of the first cards to spike, like what happened with the rewave of the Fire Fist support from Fist of the Gadgets, or when Zodiacs were first announced as well. Honestly, this archetype does look really, really broken. They have so many strong cards. I think they might actually be a top tier deck when we finally do get it here in the TCG, assuming that they hit and kind of rebalance a couple of the other decks in the current format. Of course, I don't think that this means that you should be paying that much for an ulti tanky. It will, of course, go through its usual cycle of jumping up when good support is announced and then cooling back down. It has done this several times over the past couple of years, and you definitely don't want to be buying it now while it's at its peak. Fortunately, there are a ton of other prints available if you need your copy, including the Secret Rare from Fist of the Gadgets, which is actually the set that I have set aside for myself to use, which is much more affordable at only around $4 a piece, and it looks really cool too. I think that as the next highest rarity, the secrets are worth grabbing now, though it's perfectly fine if you want to stick with commons or super rares that you should be able to grab for under a dollar. Next, let's briefly talk about Reborn Tengu. So this is also related to the Tri-Brigade archetype. This is a card that fortunately I still have multiple copies of from back when links were first revealed because this is a card that gets another copy of itself out of the deck when it is removed from the field. And because this is a mandatory effect, you don't miss timing when you link with it to link summon a monster. It also happens to be a beast warrior, so it's searchable with Tanky, and you can also banish them as materials for your link summon from the graveyard after you've linked with them on the field. Now obviously, as a new archetype, we don't have any sort of established Tri-Brigade list, but I think that this card does have a ton of potential, especially in the archetype. This card does only have two hollow printings, which were both from the same set, as it was both the Sneak Peek Ultra Rare card and a Super Rare from the packs themselves way back in Extreme Victory. As a result, you're looking at paying around $10 for a single Ultra Rare and $8 for the Super, and there's actually very few quantities available of this card on the market. You should, however, be able to grab the common structure deck reprints for under a dollar or so. This is just one of those cases of whether or not you're okay with playing commons in your deck or you feel the need to play hollows, since realistically you should be able to pick up your playset of Super supers for about $20 or so at your locals if you really need to. Of course, that is now while the Tri-Brigade archetype is still really new. If the Tri-Brigade archetype ends up being a tier 1 deck in the OCG and it starts to see tops with Reborn Tengu in the deck, then the hollows will inevitably start to go up in price. I would still be careful though because I could definitely see this card being released in maximum gold or in a December product as a reprint later on this year, especially if the Tri-Brigades continue to build up hype in in the meantime. So thankfully, we finally got a reprint of Invocation, as well as other key cards like Raijin and Kaliga from the Invoked Archetype, all confirmed to be in Battles of Legend Armageddon, which is a really welcome thing, because I know a lot of people want to play the archetype combined with other decks, like Eldlich, Shadals, and the Dragma. Now of course, when one card gets reprinted, or multiple in this case, we generally see another piece of that archetype that wasn't reprinted shoot up in price as a result, as more and more people aim to pick up the core for relative 
relatively cheap. In this case, it's Alistair the Invoker that has started to baby bump up in price. Of course, this wasn't a huge buyout or anything. We saw a bit more of a jump over the weekend, but it has since then kind of cooled back down as people list their quantities back on the market. So the secret rares were up at seven to eight dollars a piece, and now they're back down to around five or six, which is still up from the couple of bucks they were before. And then even the supers, right, as the lower rarity version, they were up at four to five dollars a piece, and now they're back down to around two to three. Not a huge price jump, but it is worth noting that if you want to play Invoked anytime soon with the reprint of Invocation you should probably pick up your copies of Alistair the Invoker fairly soon, because as more and more people want to utilize this really splashable engine, the quantities of Alistair on the market will go down, and its price for even the supers will slowly climb up. Obviously, this isn't something that I would recommend investing in or buying a ton of copies of, but rather, I just recommend that you pick up your playset just in case so that you have it for your own use. Next up, we have Medulce Hootcake. So we were kind of on the fence about this leading up to Battles of Legend. Oftentimes when we see a key card reprinted from an archetype, we'll see other things from that same archetype reprinted as well. However, Battles of Legend Armageddon was weird in that we saw Angeli reprinted, but we didn't have any other Medulce cards included as well, so we didn't see Hootcake or Messengelato or anything like that. As a result, we did see a tiny bump up in the price of Hootcake. I believe they were around the $10 mark before, but now the original supers are 14 to 15 and the Megatin reprints are 11 to $12. Now, normally I would actually expect Hootcake to hit around the $20 or so price point, but in this case, we did have some fake news that actually served as a coolant on the price. Supposedly, there is a fake maximum gold spoiler list running around, but people are saying that it's from a credible source and that list has Hootcake being reprinted in maximum gold. As a result, I think people are playing a little bit more cautiously with picking cards up, especially since we won't be having any reprints before Maximum Gold officially comes out most likely. Personally, as much as the reprints that the list is showing are realistic, I'm not going to read into them too much. It actually did work out in my favor because Eldritch is on the list. And to be honest, right, like I don't think Eldritch is going to see a reprint six months after its initial release, but I actually used that news to grab myself two copies of Eldritch for about 100 Canadian each, so $75 a piece, which was really funny. That's a great price if you're looking to pick up Eldritches like I was. But yeah, check out the list on Facebook or something, but don't do anything too crazy with it unless you're maybe like selling off a hyped up card. Sorry, a little bit sidetracked there, but yeah, um, hoot cakes are definitely something that I would keep my eye on moving forward for when they likely do get bought out after people are able to get their hands on these cheaper copies of Angeli, as well as those reprints of Magiline and Chocolat a la mode from way back in Dual Overload. Okay, so we'll talk about this one really quickly. Now, of all things, Penguins got a new Synchro Monster, and this has actually caused a number of different cards to shoot up in price. Mostly irrelevant cards, but like older cards that have very limited printings. Penguins have always been kind of like sort of an archetype, but not really. Most of them do flip effect kind of things, and the Synchro does stay true to that strategy as well, though I don't know if Penguins even have a tuner or anything like that, so I don't know how you're playing the deck, but uh, let me know if you have a really solid build or anything, because it looks fun. So, I mean, Penguins aren't going to be doing anything anytime soon, right? In fact, I think even if this Synchro came out 10 or 15 years ago with all of the other Penguin cards, they still wouldn't be doing anything. But that didn't stop some really big brain people from buying out DT copies of Nightmare Penguin, which is now a $20 card lowest on TCG player at the moment, with barely any copies available. Now, admittedly, it is probably like the best card in the strategy, since you can bounce an opponent's card when it's flipped face up, and then it also boosts the attack power of all of your water monsters. But really, who's paying for this card? You could offer me one for like two bucks, and honestly, I wouldn't buy it. But whatever, if you can make these sales, like if you can find someone who's willing to pay even like five or ten dollars for a DT copy of Nightmare Penguin, go ahead and make the sale because that's basically free money going right into your pocket. All right, so another bit of a strange one, we had two new Dragoonity main deck monsters revealed for their upcoming structure deck, and those cards are actually really amazing. I think that if the other cards that they're getting in the deck are just as good, they will be a very scary strategy, especially if they end up mixing with the Guard Dragons and the Rockets and the other pieces of Dragon Link. Now, one card that has jumped up in price because of the Dragoonity cards is Mist Valley Baby Rock, who is actually a winged beast, not a dragon, and it's a Mist Valley card, not a Dragoonity, who would have guessed? 
This card can be special summoned when it's discarded by a card effect. Unfortunately, it can miss timing. However, it is played in Dragoonities as a level 2 wind tuner that can special summon itself after being searched and then discarded by Gay Dirk. We're currently looking at $13 a piece for the DT versions and then even a whole $5 to $6 for just the super rares and those are the only two printings of this card. Where this card settles at depends on the validity of the Dragoonity cards when they do come out and how they'll impact in the meta. Although I could see this card flopping and then falling back down, much like a lot of the Dragoonity cards we've seen in the past, at best it could be just as useful as something like Jirakaiolo, which basically has the same printings and function in their respective decks, but Aeolo and Dinosaurs have kind of established themselves as already being meta relevant. This is definitely a card that you can try and dig out of some of your hollow bulk. Keep your one or two copies if you are interested in playing Dragoonities when the structure deck comes out because I think it's fairly unlikely to be reprinted in there, but I would move your extra copies now while they are building up some hype since I also think that there's a lot of potential for this card to be reprinted in an OTS tournament pack as a common. So we're onto a card that I actually saw some people talking about on Facebook earlier and that is Neospatian Aqua Dolphin. So we saw this card before with Gokies, right, but with Infernal Noble Knights, they're another deck that can be utilizing Neo Space Connector and Aqua Dolphin to make a sold really easily. Aqua Dolphin having the added benefit of being able to potentially rip a card out of your opponent's hand. I think that this play is really good, and I do think that this combo will definitely see play when the rest of the Infer Noble Knights come to the TCG in Rise of the Duelist later this year. However, some people have taken this to a bit of an extreme, buying out the ultimate rare version of Neospatian Aqua Dolphin, which now sits at $350 a piece, lowest on TCG player at the moment, which is obviously just like insane, right? Obviously, I don't recommend buying this card at this price, but I don't think that this is really in the realm of cards that most of us can reasonably afford to spend money on. Fortunately, this card was reprinted as a common in Legendary Duelist Magical Hero, so accessible Accessibility shouldn't be an issue at all, and if you really want a hollow version, you can use Ultras from Battles of Legend Relentless Revenge as well. I actually think the Ultras look really clean, I have a Europrint set myself that I use for my own play, which in all honesty does exactly the same as the ulti, but it isn't going to cost you like a thousand dollars for the set. So this is one that people have been kind of freaking out about recently, and that is the Lost Art version of Foolish Burial, so I think that people are acknowledging that the Lost Art promo cards are going to make really good long-term holds and appreciate in value, especially if they stay sealed, so a lot of people are picking them up wherever possible. Also, with so many places still in lockdown, the Lost Art cards for this year can be especially hard for people to get, and this limited availability is resulting in higher overall prices. Now, earlier this year, we already saw a buyout of the Lost Art Monster Reborn, which was really interesting to see. It felt a little bit early for a buyout of something like that. Foolish Burial is similar in that even though it's also limited, it is still a really iconic generic card that a lot of different decks can utilize and most people will still recognize it. It is still early, but we're already seeing it at the $25 price point, which isn't too bad though it does still feel really early. It's been just like a couple of months since the release of Foolish Burial, yet it was over a year before we saw the initial buyout of the Lost Art version of Monster Reborn. But yeah, this is a card that you'll want to keep your eye on over the next little while. If you are holding on to Lost Art promo cards, I would definitely recommend just holding them and letting them appreciate in price over time. In particular, I think that Skill Drain is really interesting as one of the more iconic and generic, easily recognizable cards in the game, yet it's still limited, right? And it could definitely see a price spike in the very near future. And finally guys, the last card I'm going to talk about here is Cyber Emergency. So just a couple of days ago, we got the first archetype from the side set, Genesis Impactors finally revealed to us, known as the Drytron. They look pretty interesting, somewhat similar to Incantations, and they're a ritual archetype, though they only have one ritual monster in them. They are pretty cool, I definitely recommend reading up on them if you haven't already. Now most of the main deck monsters are level 1 light machines that cannot be normal summoned or set, and it just so happens that Cyber Emergency searches light machine monsters that cannot be normal summoned or set. So yeah, Cyber Emergency is getting some attention for a reason other than Cyber Dragons, which I guess is kind of interesting. Because of this we have seen a small bump in the price of Cyber Emergency, with the original secret rares at around $17 each, and the reprint ultra rares at about $5. Now the big thing that's stopping this card from going crazy in terms of price is the fact that in Genesis Impactors in the OCG, 
Cyber Emergency was actually reprinted in the set itself, leading people to believe that when we get the set here, it will also be reprinted. So yeah, that definitely kind of caps how high we can expect these prices to go, and unless you're wanting to take a huge bet, I think it is safer to assume that they will be in the set and not invest in this card. Overall, I do think that the Secret Rares will actually retain a lot of their value, regardless of if it sees a reprint or not, as it is the highest rarity and original print of the card. And remember, we do have that Cyber Dragon structure deck getting second place at that poll in the OCG, so we should expect the card to go up again when those cards are officially revealed. However, the Ultras as the lower rarity would definitely lose the little value that they're currently holding onto. If the card were reprinted as something like a super rare in a side set, you can still hold on to a playset of the ultra rares anyways just in case, because it is just a 10 to $15 investment that you'd be holding on to, and it's not like it's going to depreciate that much more in value. But if you're looking for an excuse to pick up secret rare cyber emergencies, I think you should look at doing it within the next couple of months just in case the new Draytron or the new Cyber Dragon support makes this card meta relevant once again, since clearly the card is useful now in more than just one deck. Alright guys, that is it for today's episode. I know we glossed over a lot of different things today, but hopefully it gives you guys an idea of what other cards you could potentially be keeping an eye on moving forward when you're either looking for cards to offload or for cheap cards to pick up now. I know that Battles of Legend Armageddon maybe isn't as great as a lot of people were hoping, but it's still definitely going to have its effects on the market, so be sure to stay as diligent as possible for when those opportunities do come up so that you can take advantage of them. Anyways guys, if you did enjoy today's Market Watch and you want to see another Market Watch later this week where we discuss some of the smaller things and maybe some potential investment opportunities, please make sure that you hit that thumbs up button for me as it does help out a ton. Also make sure you leave a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know what other cards you want me to cover on a Market Watch later this week or in future episodes so that I can keep all of you guys as viewers as up to date as possible. And of course if you haven't already, make sure that you hit that subscribe button for all of our following market watches as well as all of the other content that both Tombox and I post here on the channel and uh yes yeah, so until next time guys don't forget to hold on to your mst.tv